to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in answer to those who came looking for Jesus, Jesus said, Did you not know I must be about my Father's business? Luke chapter 2, verse number 49. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of Luke. Today's broadcast, the Gospel of Christ, is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. We're so glad that you've joined us for our program today. If ever you'd like to have a copy of our lesson on DVD, CD, or a transcript, you can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. All that we have there is free and available for download. Also, maybe if you've got a Bible question, something maybe you've been considering in your own personal studies, send us an email, contact us. We'll be glad to hear from you. And our hope and prayer is that each of us will grow closer to a knowledge of God as we study His will together. As we think now about the book of Luke, we find that in Luke chapter 9, in this third lesson in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 9, Jesus now gets to the heart and core of what real Christianity is all about. Ask yourself this, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to follow Jesus every day? On a daily, practical, everyday, relevant level, what does Jesus expect of me and you? Let's notice those words from Luke chapter 9, verse number 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. When we talk about practical Christianity, it doesn't get any more practical than this. Inside these words of Jesus, there are three requirements to really follow Jesus. First, you've got to have that desire, meaning you've got to want to. John 7, 17, if anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. You've got to have a desire to please God and to do what he wants more than anything else. Like Paul, we've got to be willing to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Acts chapter 9, verse 6, like Samuel, 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 3, Samuel said, Lord, speak. That's the attitude. Here am I. Send me. Isaiah chapter 9. Do we really have that desire that more than anything we want to please God and go to heaven? Then you've got to be willing to deny. Deny self. If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself. There's the hard part. There's the challenge. This is what keeps a lot of people from really making that 100% commitment to Jesus Christ. I've got to realize We've got to realize when we obey the gospel, it's no longer about us. The old man died. The new man has been raised to put God's will first. Do you remember Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2? Paul said, I beg you, by the mercies of God, listen to this, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How is my life to be viewed? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. What in the world is a living sacrifice? Paul further elaborates on this in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. When he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Listen now, and you are not your own. What do you mean? You are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. I am not, you are not your own. When Christ paid the ultimate price, his blood, Acts 20, verse 28, purchased me back to God. Then I submitted allegiance, 100% allegiance to Christ. 
Paul gives us another perfect illustration of this. Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Friend, are we really ready to have that desire? Are we really willing to deny self and then Will we do what's necessary daily? Take up your cross daily and follow me. Will we take up the, the, the Christian strength and weaknesses and all the, the shame that we may have to bear? Will we take up what Christianity really means and will we follow Jesus each and every day? This is the challenge, to take up that cross, that symbol of what Christ and Christianity represents and uh, get in line behind Jesus and follow Him every day. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Acts 4 verse 13, we learn of Christians, the people around them realized they had been with Jesus. Acts 4 verse 13, and Peter records in 1 Peter 2 21, for to this were you called, because Christ also suffered and died, leaving us an example that we should follow in His footsteps. And friend, as we think about following in the footsteps of Jesus, an illustration is given in Luke chapter 9 of the need to keep looking the right way, keep going in the right direction, and not turn back. Notice Luke chapter 9, verse number 62. The Scripture says, But Jesus said to them, said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. What's it like when I take up that... That when I take up Christianity, when I obey the gospel, when I'm a Christian, what's my life to be like? Like this illustration. Like a man out in the field who's plowing. He puts his hand to the plow and he keeps looking at a focal point ahead and he makes a straight row in the right direction. Let me give you an illustration of why this is important. I was raised on a small farm in East Texas and one of the things that we did every year, we had cattle, and one of the things that we did every year is we had to cut hay. And I always thought that was the neatest process and always wanted to help my dad. I remember when I was probably 11 or 12 years old, just starting to learn how to drive a pickup truck a little bit. I remember we had a hay rake that operated based off a belt on the wheels and you could pull it behind a truck. And I thought, boy, that would be neat to do. I think I could do a great job at it. And so like the persistent widow, I kept after my dad until he finally gave in and decided to let me try that. And so I thought I'm going to do the best job I can. I'm going to give great attention to detail. And so I got behind the wheel of that truck and I'm raking that hay row. And I just remember every little bit I'd look back just to make sure I was doing a great job. And I'd go forward a little, look back, and I, you know what? When I got to the end of that hay row, it was as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Why? Looking back makes crooked rows. Plowing. Cutting hay, raking hay, and friend, looking back makes crooked Christians. You cannot give a hundred percent to God and look back. You don't believe me? Ask Lot's wife. Luke chapter 17, these little words will echo forever. Remember Lot's wife. What about Lot's wife? Who was she? Lot and his family left Sodom and Gomorrah that wicked and evil place. They got out of there. God told them to. God helped them get out through His messengers, but Lot's wife had to have just one little look back. Turn to a pillar of salt right there. Don't look back. Once you become a Christian, leave that behind. If then you were raised with Christ, seek the things which are above. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. Be faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. Let's now turn our attention to a very interesting scene about really putting God first in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Notice this with me for just a moment. Here's a, a Mary or a Martha type of individual. The Bible says, Now it happened as they went that Jesus entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed Him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard His word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached Him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but 
one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. When you think here about these two women, two sisters, Mary and Martha, both were doing good things. Hey, service is good. We're called to be servants. Mark 10, verse 45, sitting at the feet of Jesus is good. And so it's not as though one is good and one is bad. It's which one's better? Which one ought to come first? I can't believe the mindset of Martha here. Jesus comes to the house and no doubt she wants everything to be straightened up. She wants to have something to serve Jesus with, something to give Him. And so she's distracted. She's busy with all this service. And here's Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus learning. And Martha has the gall to say to Jesus, Lord, can't you see I'm busy with all this serving? And my sister's just sitting here. And she says, tell her to get up and help me. And listen to the words of Jesus. Martha, Martha. You're worried and distracted about many things. Here it is. One thing is needed. Mary's chosen that good part which cannot be taken away from her. Friend, when we think about things of utmost importance, what's really important? Here it is. Serving God is important, but studying about God and learning who He is, coming to a knowledge of His truth and obeying the gospel is more important. Friends, sometimes in life it's easy to get distracted. Jobs, family, recreation, the day-to-day -day things we have to deal with, those can distract us from what's really important. What's really important? My soul and your soul. One day, each of us is going to give an account to God of Himself. Romans 14, 12. One day, I will stand before the almighty throne of God. Books will be opened and I'll give an account based on the things I've done in this life. Revelation 20 verses 12 through 15. If I don't think about that soberly, seriously, and make it my main priority, friend, there's a chance, a real chance, that all this distraction can keep me from doing what God wants me to do. And so what's most important? studying at the feet of Jesus. What's most important? Learning of Him. What's really essential? Learning how to get right, to, to live like Jesus wants me to live, and know His will, and put it first in each and every way in my life. You know, I learn that learning from Jesus is the most important thing, and a great example of that is seen in Luke chapter 11, verse number 1. Let me give you the background and the context. Some of Jesus... Uh, John's disciples had heard Jesus, uh, had heard John praying, and they come to Jesus and they say in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, these powerful words, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples to pray. Now, we want to focus about the idea of prayer in just a moment, but I want you to hear these words carefully. This is the mindset, and this is the motivation every child of God needs. Lord, Teach us. There's the idea. It's not, Lord, I've got it figured out, or Lord, I think I know, or, or this is what I ought to do. No, the mindset of humility and submission is, we don't know. We're not right. You're right. Lord, teach us. Oh, that more people had that as their mentality. Wouldn't they then approach the Bible differently? with the mindset of being ready to learn. 1 Peter 3, verse 15, ready to study. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, ready to search the Scriptures each and every day. Acts 17, verse 11. And then you realize their request was, Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer is not something that I innately know how to do, that I'm just born knowing how to do. Prayer is a learned trait. I learn of God in the Bible how to pray. Ought to pray that God's will will be done. Matthew 26. Ought to pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John chapters 14 and 15 clearly illustrate that idea. And ought to pray that, that God will use me in His kingdom to reach the lost and do as much good as I can in each and every way. Now friend, let's think about another man that we've mentioned previously, and that is the rich fool. I want you to hear about the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, 
verses 15 through 21. Notice these words. The Scripture records, And Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Now here's his, how he's going to illustrate it. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain ma rich man yielded plentifully. He thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater, and there I'll store all my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you've got, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose things will those be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Look at this foolish man. He, he, nothing wrong with his business ventures. It's great that he had a great crop year. Nothing wrong with that. And you can understand he might have to at times build a bigger barn if his barn wouldn't hold that. None of that is the problem. What's the problem? That man, in all his farming, in all his business ventures, in all his tearing down and building up, forgot to take care of the one important thing above all else. This night, your soul will be required of you. This man failed miserably because he didn't think about his most important possession. He's thinking about possessions, crops and barns and things of that nature. What about the most important possession? His soul failed miserably to ever consider it and was lost eternally. So is he who lays up treasure for himself but is not rich toward God. Don't let the cares, pleasures, and things of this world get in the way of your eternal soul and I've got to make sure it doesn't get in the way of my eternal soul as well. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. Let's not let the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, get in the way of each of us putting God first and going to heaven. You know, to really make the change that I need to make, that every individual needs to make in his life, true repentance is required. And Jesus illustrates the need for every person to do that in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. As we study the Gospel of Luke, and as you think about the Gospel in general, repentance is one of the key ideas. And notice what Luke says about that, what Jesus says about that in Luke 13, 1. The Scripture records, there were present at that season some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. What's the problem here? The problem here is this. People, like people sometimes do, were looking at others and their sin to justify themselves. And so Jesus, knowing what's within man, John 2 verse 25, knows what they're thinking. And he says, what about these Galileans? These Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifice, meaning Pilate killed them, mingled their own blood with the blood of the sacrifice at that time. Because Pilate did that thing, because they died giving sacrifice to God, do you suppose they were worse than all other Galileans? Well, one might be prone to think that. Here are these people. Pilate mingled their blood with the blood of their own sacrifices. Wonder what they did to deserve that. And then, what about this tragedy that struck? Eighteen people walking down the road in Siloam. Tower out of falls on them out of nowhere. Wasn't that the, the vengeance? God weren't you in your own way crushing those ungodly people for their ungodly acts. These Galileans, these 18 people in Siloam, they must have been worse than all other people. 
I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What's Jesus saying? Stop focusing on these Galileans. Stop focusing on these 18 people who were walking down the road in Siloam and start focusing on yourself. Friend, the, the thing about the power of the gospel is it needs to reach me first. I need to let God's Word prick my heart. Acts 2 verse 37. Instead of looking around and saying, well, they're doing this and they're doing that and they go to church and they do this. Hey, let's cut all that out and let's think about ourselves. We must repent to be right with God. That means I've got to turn from sin. Acts 3 verse 19. I've got to change my way of thinking. Luke chapter 3 verse 6. I've got to change my way of acting and I've got to live according to the will of Almighty God in every way. Now, in Luke chapter 14, hand in hand with this idea of repentance is the humility we need to make that change. Look at how Jesus expects us to humble ourselves and repent. Luke 14, verse 11, the Scripture says, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Unlike these people in Luke 13, I need the ability not to try to exalt myself over others, but rather humble myself. What happens to the man who exalts himself? Oh, he'll be humbled. How is that? Philippians 2, verses 8 and 9, all will one day have to confess with their mouth, to the glory of God that Jesus is the Christ. There's a day coming when all men will be humbled at the feet of Jesus. What about the other side of that coin? Whoever humbles himself, he'll one day be exalted. He'll get to live in heaven with God forever. Now, a lot of the times though, in cases like these, people throw out excuses. Well, I can't do that because this, or I would repent, but, or you know, I just can't really follow Jesus because. You know, Jesus in Luke 14 deals with excuses also. Look in Luke chapter 14 at what the Scripture says in verse number 18. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. Here's the background of that. Jesus has made the great invitation call. Uh, the illustration is the Master has said, Come to the supper. One man said, I can't come because I've uh, bought a piece of property and I need to go look at it. Another man said he can't come. I bought a team of oak or oxen. I need to test them. Uh, the most foolish of all, the man says, I've just married a wife and I can't come to the supper. Now, I know it's the most foolish of all because how many newlyweds can afford to miss a free meal? I couldn't. You probably couldn't either. These are all excuses and Jesus knows that. And you know what he says? They all, with one accord, began to make excuses. Friend, my excuses, your excuses, our excuses won't work on the day of judgment. If I'm unwilling to sit at the feet of Jesus like Mary, if like the rich fool, I don't take care of my soul and I say, Lord, but I was busy serving or Lord, I was busy farming or if I'm too busy looking at others and I say, well, Lord, I never obeyed the gospel because so-and-so goes to church there and he's as ungodly as anybody. How well will those excuses work on the day of judgment? Friend, they won't. Jesus said they all with one accord began to make excuses and the master in that scene was greatly upset. And friend, I'll assure you, on the day of judgment, Jesus will not accept our excuses. Those excuses will calls us to be lost. Now, as we think about the joy, though, of turning our life over to God, Luke chapter 15 illustrates that in a very vivid and beautiful way. Luke chapter 15, we refer as the four lost things. You've got the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the two lost sons. Do you remember the lost coin? The woman lost the coin. She swept her whole house till she found it. Rejoice greatly. The lost sheep, the had 100 sheep, uh, left the 99 behind, went and found the one sheep, called his friends. There was great rejoicing over that one sheep. The prodigal son goes away. He uh, is out in the far land. His brother's upset at home when he comes back because the father wants to receive him. You've got two lost sons there. One lost because of prodigal living. One lost over jealousy. Look at the rejoicing that goes on there. Friend, there's a passage I want you to think about in Luke chapter 15, verse number 10. How does God feel about someone who repents? 
the Bible says, likewise, this is Jesus speaking, likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. How does, how does heaven feel when somebody turns their life around and gives it to God? There's rejoicing. The angels in heaven rejoice. That's how God feels. It's not a sad moment. It's not an embarrassing moment. It's not anything to be embarrassed by. Rather, if heaven rejoices, how we ought to rejoice as well. And here's why. Because Luke 16, 19 through 31 teaches there are only two choices. Rich man and Lazarus. The rich man made bad decisions in this life. Went to hell on the other side. Went to torment. Uh, Lazarus, that poor beggar, didn't have anything in this life. Had God though. He went to paradise. Friend, it's real important that we make sure we put our life right first. As you think today about your own life, as you think today about serving God, about putting Him first, about not making excuses, about the joy of repentance and living for God, friend, let's realize that eternity truly makes it all worth it. Have you really thought soberly and seriously about your own soul? Don't let the busyness of this life, don't let the distractions in the world and, and the things that often get in the way take first place. Your soul is the most important possession you have. Long after this old world is gone, your soul will abide somewhere forever. You have the power now. With God's grace and plan of salvation, you have the power to do something about that. Will you do something today? Friend, we want you to know today that God loves you deeply. We love you and want you to go to heaven. Won't you obey the gospel? In Acts chapter 2, when they had heard the word, when they believed the message, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here was the answer. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you've heard the message, if you believe in Jesus, if you're willing to repent and turn from sin, wouldn't you be baptized for the remission of your sins today? Acts 2 verse 38. And if you've all done all that, then friend, our encouragement to you is... Take up your cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. We hope you'll join us again as we think more about the gospel of Christ and God's plan for mankind recorded in the gospel of Luke. Rise you may have just joined our program wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? Like the gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the church of Christ that reaches the whole world with, with the gospel pride. through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for every book we say in it. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com.